Welcome to this full review of the Peugeot 3008 plug-in hybrid as the sporty top GT trim or other way around Peugeot 3008 GT Hybrid 4. Well, however you want to take it, this top version here with the new hybrid drive in exterior, interior and the driving experience here on Autocofuel, your number one resource for in-depth car reviews and your number one community to discuss cars. Thomas in front of the camera, Jonas behind and everything of that. Full HD, full screen and full length. Let's go! Please subscribe to us if you haven't done so far and thank you so much to our long-term subscribers. Here the Peugeot 3008 already has a quite strong stance in the front with this Dodge style grille, chrome effect and this one as the GT trim has a sporty lower bumper as well and contrasting here to this Ulti red or ultimate red I would call it very strong red color, I really like that. So at the moment, at least for now, and probably this will also continue, the plug-in hybrid is only available in the combination with the GT trim because they just want to put it up market like a full spec car and so on. And we can see the full LED headlamps also come in this package then already because they're part of the GT package. And also the daytime running light, a very interesting structure. So quite likable car, not too aggressive in the front, but definitely very modern. 4 meters 45, 14 foot 6 or 175 inches is the length of the Peugeot 3008. And you can see the hybrid version, you cannot really distinguish it that well to the normal one. If you take a normal 3008 GT for example, the only thing is here, we have a hybrid 4 batch here and that's basically it. In this case we have 18 inch wheels with winter tires mounted. I think still a good compromise between comfort and looks. Usually with the GT trim you will also get the 19 inch wheels which are even a little bit bigger and when you have summer tires mount they even appear bigger of course. Of course our wheel arches and in this case we have a contrasting black roof. You see here all the black area there, then the red area here again and then GT also has the contrast here in the lower part. However this split here looks a little bit weird I think. Other than that it's a very modern car also as for the side profile and here you see something of this rather central French design as well. What's your take? Pretty cool lion claw design here with the tail lamps in the rear and again this black and red split from the design. And in the lower part massive dual fake exhaust alert. Dirt, 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 dirt. So real exhaust underneath. I mean it looks quite stylish but I mean we all agree <laughs> meanwhile that we don't really need them especially if they are just like there's no, no technical anything behind it here in this case. By the way, you might wonder, yes, the Opel Grandland X or Vauxhall Grandland X hybrid also shares the same platform and also the same technology. Recently, AJ presented that video to you, so later on you can also compare those two vehicles. As for engines, you basically have a 1.5 and a 2-liter diesel engine. Then there's a small 1.2-liter three-cylinder petrol engine. And then there's the 1.6 liter four cylinder petrol engine, which is also the base for this plug in hybrid version. So you have this 1.6 petrol already with a turbo, and then you have an electric motor in the front and one in the rear. This one then is called the hybrid four model. However, this one here, 300 horsepower system output, and there will also be just the one electric motor plug in hybrid version. It will be only in the front. This is just called hybrid, 225 horsepower as for the system output. And you'll see that across the whole PSA range when they offer those hybrid models, then there might be the hybrid 4 or the hybrid, depending on 
the cheaper entry version then when you have just the electric motor in the front and a little more expensive when you have the all-wheel drive. However, not all models across the whole range will have the all-wheel drive PF option, but the 3008 here definitely. And it's the only possibility to get this one here also somewhat rear-wheel driven. How's the distribution? We'll find out more about that in the driving part very soon. So while you fuel up on the right side, you recharge here at the left side this 13 kilowatt hour battery, either with a 3.7 kilowatt AC charger or optional 7.4, which of course makes sense. And then the realistic range would be like 40 or 50 kilometers all electric or 25, 30 miles approximately. This is the car key. They're quite thick here in the PSA group, but they actually feel quite good. Then, door closing sound. It's quite solid. Keyless entry would be here, then push on the outside or put your hand on the inside. Then, inside of the doors. This is here the GT trim. So we have soft touch on the top part. And then, in the GT line, the GT trim, the total one, both you also have Alcantara and in this case not only black but in the hybrid version exclusively in grey. Beautiful and creates this living room atmosphere. Really very well done. We've seen it in the Peugeot 2008, the all-electric version also. So for the electrification models they obviously reserve this grey Alcantara. Then the black leatherette also with soft touch here at the inside of the doors. So good build quality as for those pieces. And then you have some bottle holders here at the inside of the doors. The GT trim also comes with this badge at the steering wheel, but you also in normal trim levels get this small steering wheel with the flat bottom. Here also soft touch materials at the dashboard. Then this eye cockpit layout, no head-up display, but this one is placed relatively high upward with a modern digital instrument. And then the seats. So you get nice fabric options for the 3008 in general. And then in the GT line or the true GT trim, which is always combined with the strongest petrol engine, you get Alcantara then on the inside, or this microfiber and leatherette on the outside. So also an animal free solution for the seats. And again, gray for the plug-in hybrid. And this is again so well done. The seat looks amazing really. And it's also very comfortable indeed. Also fits for taller people and you can get inside quite easily. If I put it to the lowest position, I have some headroom left. This one here with the panoramic roof. If you leave it out, you have a little bit more headroom. And I tend to put the seat a little bit higher because you see it also is more upright then. The lower area here, you can put a little bit longer here in a manual way and you have a two memory seat function. You also have a seat massage function here in the highest trim then, or if you pick that option. But the massage function is, yeah, you don't really have to go for that. Doesn't make too much sense, um, won't do that much. And the steering wheel can be adjusted in and out, up and down. And the thing is, yeah, with tall people, it's a little bit better than in the smaller Peugeots. Uh, but still, either when you put it lower, it gets close to your knees, or when you put it higher, it blocks something of the instrument. But again, in 2008 and 2008 it's you know more of a problem here in the 3008 it's still okay to me so um it doesn't block too much of the instruments and doesn't come too close to my knees so i would say here is actually no problem in the 2008 and the 2008 it actually is it's really a very unique cockpit setup and also the whole design this makes this car really special now the interior overview and it's really a wow interior as for the styling already. 
Again, with this small steering wheel, very sporty to handle, digital instruments, then this top infotainment screen. Then you have these buttons right here. They are still physical and you can actually press them with host keys and the lower ones as well. And good that we still also have a real volume knob that you can tune down or up in a very fast way. And also for the seat heating, you have separate knobs. Soon we'll give you more details to the screens and so on. First of all, I also want to stress here again, wow, this gray Alcantara service is really, really cool. Special to the PF version, you also have a lightning button right here that directly gets you to the special screen where you have, you know, all the different statistics in the infotainment system. We'll also take a look at that when we drive very soon. Then in the lower part, you can connect your phone for the Apple CarPlay or Android Auto with the cable. Or below that, there's also inductive charging platform. Then you have this automatic shifting lever and some cubbyhole driving modes. We'll talk about the different driving modes, of course, later on. Hilton control can be activated right here. And then you have adaptive cup holders and also nice soft leatherette surface here for the armrest and you flip it up and have reasonable storage underneath you can also remove that and have really a lot of space so at the steering wheel you can change the volume here left thumb and also the views of the digital instruments and there's also a voice input button it's not a natural voice input but you have some useful commands to begin say a command after the tone Increase temperature. Temperature changed. So that's a way to change the temperature while driving, for example. And then on the right side of the steering wheel, you can pick up or cancel the phone, um, pick a different audio source, and then this would be rather here to control something in the right screen, but there won't be much use case for that other than radio scrolling. Digital instruments. Interesting, by the way, this separate button to activate or deactivate the light below that. Interesting, right? Then you have this screen where you have the battery where it is and can follow when the electric motors are active. We'll follow that when we drive the car. And also on the right side, you know, when you're using the maximum power or when you are recuperating. And you can also change the views here depending on what you want to see. You also have this so-called minimalistic view. Um, so not too much information, you can personalize it as well here, so everything looks differently. Or have the GPS in the middle part, that's possible and also quite cool. Other than that, even if you have the other gauges activated, you will get some GPS information when you reach the next intersection. And that's of course a pretty helpful thing. That's the way it would usually, for example, look with an analog view. That's also possible, like a digital analog view. But in this case, maybe the energy view for the BHEV makes the most sense. So the infotainment system, this would be when I hit this lightning button for, or I can also pick it individually in the menu. We can see again what is doing with the, what is the car doing with the whole electric system. There's also some statistics or you can time you're charging or e-save if you want to save some battery status for later. By the way, there's one trick to get to a main menu. Sometimes forget to mention that, like with three fingers, you hit the screen with three fingers, then you're in this hidden main menu. It's a little bit strange because you really have to know that, that it's possible because there's no main menu key or something like that. And then you can, for example, access the Apple CarPlay. It's a good integration, uses all of the screen, for example. And it's actually a very nice sound with this focal sound system here. Um, really, you know, yeah, that's a classic, like 20 years or something. Yeah, I'm an old school guy. So um, really good surround sound. And let's, for example, hit the GPS button in the lower part. Then we go to this and it's actually quite responsive, but not the best GPS, but it does the job, basically, so to say. Then there's this app view where you can access the CarPlay or then the car apps that would be where I access the energy one. And again, you can 
jump, jump back to the main menu right there. Only thing is here with the climate function. Mm, yeah, I mean, doing that while driving is not too good. So the PSA system, Peugeot and Citroën, is more like you put it on 22 degrees Celsius and AC on and automatic and leave it as it is. Controlling it while driving, changing it while driving. Yeah, maybe with the voice control, but again, a little bit complicated. By the way, a nice function when I put in the reverse gear, here with the high trim, then also the side mirrors automatically go down. And when you put in the front drive again, it goes up. So it's really helpful for parking in, in and out. As for the panoramic roof, there's this shade. That one opens and then you can also open the whole thing like this. And yeah, leaves a lot of light inside and the opening is also quite wide indeed in you know both ways also with the gray beautiful microfiber here for the rear seats again this is design was very well done and comfort wise at the same time so cool to have something unique peugeot is not officially one of those official premium brands but i mean looking at that one here i think this is a premium car and in this case also premium pricing <laughs> yeah we'll talk later about the pricing also here especially of the p half model also we have the gray alcantara at the inside of the doors once again pretty cool and also the optional focal sound system it's also pretty nice we can you know hurt it already so let's get inside and being one minute 86 or six foot one the headroom in the rear is yeah very close with the panoramic roof so I do fit in here, yes, but it would be more room above me without the primary roof. Yet again, I can watch outside. So for four tall adults like me, it's no problem. Here also with the um, knee room, it would be better for my for my um, for my legs actually and for my feet when the front seat would be a little bit higher. And then also, you know, this gap here would fit even better. It would be then, you know, like this. So bear that in mind, maybe tell the other guy in the front, even if you all put the seat a little bit more up, then it fits even better. So it's definitely quite okay. You can put those head restraints up. You can also sit very comfortably here. The seat bench, it falls a little bit to the rear, but still that's quite okay. And there's no limit here to the p version. So since they stored the battery at the, um, floor and it was already planned to do that there's no compromise here as for the rear seats then this middle part here you can flip it out cup holders but then they are not really adaptive and then there's also a ski hatch available i can reach through there like this and in the very middle part here, you see here um, there's hardly any middle tunnel that's good because of this suv setup and then there's here a 230 volt uh, 220 volt supply so you can also um, yeah maybe charge your laptop here and something so that's also cool let's open the hatch and also works here with this foot kick opening mechanism if you're not hands-free and it's about 400 liters in the base setup you see here square dimensions that's cool and 1350 liters approximately when we flip the seats very soon so here below that you can have storage of the cable that's a good and clean solution other than that, there's not a real compromise also for the trunk. It's the same liter figures. That's also cool here for the PF version. And the normal length here is almost 90 centimeters. The height of or below the cover here, 47 centimeters. And the width, as usual, a little bit more than a meter. So that's actually quite cool, especially here. Good dimensions. Then we can already flip the seats from here. This is not a good build quality, by the way, if you're from the handles. Um, other than that, we see a lot of good build quality stuff, but also some but minor weaknesses here that flips very well. And well, we could push it a little bit more down. This, by the way, here, the ski hatch part. We could push it a little bit more down when we put the head restraints up but then we would need to move the front seats way in the front and that won't work then for tall people in the front. So, and the length here to the front seats as Jones and I would be normally seating, this is about one meters 63. And to put in some luggage that you can see how that works, see here that 
cabin trolley also works in a vertical way below that so you can have a good imagination of that and last but not least there's child safety test for the electric hatch let's see how that one plays out whoa whoa that's a strong torque maybe a little bit too strong Welcome to Thomas's Driving Lounge with the Peugeot 3008 PHEV or Hybrid 4 in this case as it's called because we have also the rear wheel drive, the all-wheel drive and starting it all silent in the all-electric mode. So I also see the visualization here in the top of the display. Um, there is also one for, for here, car apps, energy, and there you can see basically the same. So um, then you can see at the moment we're just rolling, the battery pack is in the middle part of the car and it's ideal function here for being in a small city. So you can just roll all electric and you're more silent for everyone around us and no local emissions than here. When I'm a little bit on the brakes, then there's also the green rear axle it's a little bit delayed here on the right side, have you seen that? So it appears earlier on the left side. And here when I'm a little bit on the throttle, then you can see just the rear... So at the moment we have rear wheel drive only. So this system is, you have the combustion engine on the front axle, only drives that one. Then you have an electric motor in the front and an electric motor in the rear, at least in this version. There will also be the version that is just the electric motor in the front, the non-all-wheel drive PHEV. And so at the moment, when you drive all electric, it's predominantly the rear axle only. That's really interesting, you know, isn't it? So, and of course, when you have the full power, then both electric motors, front and rear axle, would support. So here we have a little bit more on the throttle. Still, you see the rear axle remains. And here we have to pay attention to those speed cameras. Damn you. <laughs> So and then on the brakes, recuperation, and I also see it here in this charging meter and it's really in, you know, nice and relaxed ride, definitely. So, but what happens when I'm a little bit more on the throttle? Let's just, you know, test it out, everything. A little bit more. Yeah, I mean, gives me a good electric boost, actually. So, um, let's see. We can accelerate even further out. Let's see, like, like about 50 to 100. Well, that's it already and there you see when I'm hammering it all through then the combustion engine also gets activated. The combined power output, maximum power output is 5.9 seconds. It's about two seconds faster actually than the strongest petrol engine so far. So that's also pretty cool. But I really feel uh, resistance in the pedal so I can also accelerate quite fast electric only. I just need to stay with the foot before you know this threshold there in the in the throttle really interesting so we also have different driving modes where i can adjust it a little bit so for example let's go from up this is for wd all-wheel drive so this ensures that you know we're a little reduced in the stability control that we have a little bit more wheel spin and so on but obviously you know when a car is just rolling there's nothing happening so that would when i'm here you know, on the throttle then directly also the rear motor is being used so that all-wheel drive is unsured most of the time probably you won't use it sport is that what i've been talking about that we have maximum power from the combustion engine and from the electric motors so that you're a little bit more tuned rpms turn up higher and so on Hybrid then would be the standard mode where the vehicle selects itself what to do. So that would be, let's say, the normal driving mode for this one. Um, depending on the situation, the car says then, okay, I do it this and there. There you can see when the yellow is on, then the, also the combustion engine is running. And then there is the electric mode. And in this case here also, the combustion engine gets shut off. I'm in the electric mode and I stay there. 
as long as I don't exceed this power threshold again. I can also see it here in the central gauge. So it's actually quite well done. Easier solution than with the Volvo. So here it is clearer. You know, recently Volvo XC40 PHEV review. And here I see it more clear what is actually happening. So, and um, definitely it's easier to keep up than when I'm in which mode and also to stay all electric. And the best thing is, of course, um, doing it like I, I do it here at the moment. Let's say this would be my daily commuting way to work, um, which was like a couple of years ago, part of my daily commuting <laughs> way to work, by the way. Just, yeah. Um, and this, you know, this is really funny, you know. So, um, this could really work work out very well. Let's say you can charge at home or you can charge at work, and then you can just commute all electric during the week. And on the weekend, maybe you want to take a longer trip, and then you would use the combustion engine for an overland drive. So this would be the ideal use case. Yes, we know there are a lot of um, plug-in hybrid customers who don't charge frequently. That's definitely a problem because then you're just carrying the extra weight around you. And the normal fuel consumption for the combustion engine, like going just straight the motorway, will be somewhat the same um, than if you don't have it. Because yes, there's some recuperation happening, but then again, you have some extra weight, so that evens it out a little bit. The advantages of the plug-in hybrid, of course, when you have more stop and go, where you can use more um, recuperation, and then use something from the battery once again. Um, that is really helpful then, definitely. And of course, even more so when you charge it, that you can drive more on the electric drive. And again, it's like always with the plug-in hybrid vehicles, it is more fun to drive it all electric and it's more silent. Yet again, you have some power there. Uh, you have it also rear-wheel driven, so that's uh, making it a little bit sporty as well. And it fits to the good noise insulation here in this vehicle and to this living room atmosphere, enjoying the grey Alcantara. And then it just fits so well that you have also the silent drive from the electric motors. I'm not sure why this guy is holding me. I mean, should I exceed the speed limit even more? It's like, yeah. Sometimes it's really, um, really strange what people uh, try to urge you to do. So, yeah, that's the thing. But back to our review. So, again, situations like those, you know, people try to bully you maybe a little bit or something, try to force you in driving faster than it is allowed, but overthink about your driver's license, of course. And in this case, again, I have the electric drive, I can stay a little bit calmer and so on, and this is really cool. So, we have about this 40 kilometers, 25 miles, um, all electric drive range here at the moment um, depends on, of course, how much you hammer the throttle and so on. But for most commuting ways, it would actually be enough. And I think it's really cool, depends on the plug in hybrid concept, that you are able to hammer this one. You know, you can maybe also see when there's next uh, GPS information approaching, then the display is changing. That's also pretty cool. It's automatically changing and showing me a next intersection. And let's see how the all electric drive here performs on the motorway. So we can also test that out. And just like um, from 80 kilometers, let's see, that's that's nice. monitor, by the way, here this red dot, but appearing just in the moment when the cars are there, not in advance, that's the PSA system. So, and when we just accelerate out now a little bit with the electric drive, before the threshold, you see here 100, 110. So that's reasonable, you know? It's of course not like with the all electric vehicles where you can push it all the way through, but still totally fine. So I actually feel the best when I'm using this car here in an all electric way. And I would probably didn't do that until it's depleted. Um, what is the most efficient one? That is a good question. Um, probably when you use the electric drive in the city and when, let's say, we are on a longer motorway trip and driving 120 kilometers all the time. 
then maybe it's more efficient to use the combustion engine rather than depleting the electric drive and leave that one for the city. You can also go to this e-safe mode, by the way, for example, so you have an energy reserve for the city, for example. You can set it to 10 or 20 kilometers or maximum. Then the combustion engine is used on the motorway and leaves the electric drive for the city. Um, another reason for that is also that there might be some zero emission zones in cities and so on in the future or there are already um, somewhere in the world and then you need the electric reserve to actually be allowed to go inside the city or maybe without taxes or, or whatever so that's the thing again so cool drive it all electric the car itself i mean is really agile for the steering wheel it doesn't have the most natural feeling more this computer arcade game style but it's so unique here as for the whole cockpit layout and especially with the gray alcantara in this hybrid version which is again exclusive to the hybrid seen also in the all electric 2008 so the 3008 there was also this gray alcantara scheme for the electric drive um, really cool this car delivers you so much uniqueness and it is indeed more fun to drive it as the PHEV version because you have this electric possibility it will end at some point yes um, at least you can enjoy this and especially for everyone having the charging infrastructure that's pretty cool so let's see how differently the car behaves when i'm in the hybrid mode here for example now the combustion engine went on not exactly sure why maybe because of the heating i have the ac off but i have like let's say moderate heating on and heating always takes a lot of batteries so maybe in this case then the car decides it's better when we put the combustion engine on and here at the moment you see combustion engines on at the moment not the rear wheel drive and now just the combustion engine is being used so it always goes back and forth and sometimes there was front wheel front axle uh, support for the electric motor then again back for the recuperation so it goes back and forth and the car is constantly deciding and changing what to do which axle to to use where's the support with electric drive so i mean we're doing that here now for you that we can explain something but probably when you're driving the vehicle it's better than you that just you know leave it as it is and don't pay too much attention to it because it might be just too distracting for you, you know. So, um, so, but you feel the difference now. Um, you hear it like a little bit, like not really roaring, but you, you hear and feel that the combustion engine is on. And it's just, you, after driving all electric, why oh, is this again necessary? So it just feels a little bit less evolved, less futuristic and so on. So, again, so much enjoying driving it in, in, in electric mode, but still you have both worlds. So, it really depends on the use case, if that's useful or not. But again, if you don't have any recharging possibilities, then only possible tax benefits would be your actual advantage. The real advantage of this car is then, of course, when you are actually able to recharge it. So, just do a U-turn here to see also how flexible we are with this vehicle. And the cool thing is, um, here with the, um, you know, with this very light steering wheel and so on, um, I can just demonstrate that here for you. Um, just, you know, you turn around here. That's quite good for that. It's so easy to control and steer it around, and it's a lot of fun. That really helps also when parking in and out of the city. And I just feel like going back to the electric mode. I mean, rear wheel drive is cooler, right? <laughs> always the case and in this case again driving all electric and let's see when I'm accelerating out of this corner if I feel any difference as for the agility because I'm using the rear motor you know uh, and usually this is a front wheel drive platform front wheel drive bias yeah this indeed feels a little bit sportier so it's pretty cool interesting also that I hardly see that the front electric motor is being used. So, um, oh, you even see it in the visualization here when like one part of the battery is now depleted. That's really well done. Nice detail, definitely. So again, I think the most um, efficient way would be using the combustion engine on the motorway, long-term one. 
like cruise control, then like at 80 to 100 kilometers an hour cruise control, that's where combustion engines are actually quite efficient. And then using the electric drive for basically everything else, that would be the best way. And I would really rather leave it in electric mode here as long as I'm in city. I'm just, you know, calmer for inside and outside basically. Um, and it's definitely more fun to drive. Um, rather than using the hybrid and then, um, you know, having the combustion engine on here and there. So with the electric mode, you stay a little bit more in control of that and it's actually pretty cool. So it's not jumping to the combustion engine on here. I really have to, when I see the power meter goes up and then I feel more and more resistance in the throttle and so I'm I'm really pretty much in control of what I'm doing with the vehicle and with different modes and I really like that approach, you know. And it's also done in a very transparent way. Again, it's a pretty unique car, the driving feeling is really good. Suspension was also a um, good compromise here, so it's not too much leaning to the left or to the right when we go some slalom here. It feels agile, it feels sporty, it's not uncomfortable as for suspension, so I think they're very, very well found, a good compromise here in different aspects of this vehicle. And we can also do like a, like a 0 to 50 acceleration here from standstill because it's like a commercial area here. And just from the electric drive, because I'm really interested in that again, and I really have to try like to hit it with the throttle, but then not to exceed that the combustion engine goes on. Let's, let's try that. Uh, like this, yeah, it's close, yeah, uh, this 50 already, yeah. But yeah, I have to be gentle, you know, I probably could have pushed it a little bit further, but then I really didn't want the combustion engine to hop on. So why do manufacturers do that, that the combustion engine does hop on even in the electric mode? Well, they argue that in an emergency situation where you need more punch, like going on the motorway, you see like, oh, I need this spot, it would be dangerous if I wouldn't go there now and accelerate it out that the combustion engine then is being activated. So that's the thing where how they argue. And you can understand that, you know. So um, at the same time, I always like it to be all electric when I said it all electric. By the way, rear view camera wise, I also want to show you something here when finding a parking spot. It's like here, for example. So I go right there, put in reverse gear and then the helping lines show me how I can get in this spot very well. That's cool. Uh, and then here, this uh, fake journey from above camera. This car does not have a side mirror camera. So it's faking basically the drone view. So the rear feet is live and the front feet is live, but the sides is not live. And so this is basically, see the picture is being built up by past footage. Um, it's a really strange system and I'm not a fan of it. Also the resolution here is not that good, but it's always good to have a rear view camera, definitely, but it's maybe not the best solution. Then again, it's supposed to be a budget solution, so they don't need additional cameras here at the side mirror. So maybe we can also understand that. And the more and more I drive it here in the electric mode, the more and more fun it is actually. And um, sometimes when you are in a city and cruising around or here like on parking lots and so on, um, you tend to get a little bit annoyed maybe or something, but here it's the other way around. The more you do some sneaky stuff, the more you profit from the electric drive and therefore it's also good to have it. Even if you're not ready yet to go all electric, this is maybe then the first step towards it that you can still have somehow, um, you know, everything with, with, with both words, you know. Um, fuel economy wise, it's always pretty hard because now we almost drove electric all the way. We had some combustion engine which went on and then we had three liters or more kilometers. But is that the realistic fuel economy? Well, not really. It can be zero <laughs> if we went all electric and always recharge. But it also can be like seven, eight liters or more kilometers if you're just driving on the motorway with the combustion engine. And it's everything in between. So with the plug-in hybrid vehicles, it's really hard to give a concise fuel economy, that's always the thing. Um, yeah, with the Volvo, for example, we also had like, you know, the normal fuel, uh, normal fuel um, consumption on the motorway, 
and then zero, of course, when we went all electric the next day and so on. Again, it will be something in between. It really depends on your use case. So, different interesting aspects about this one here. I really, I really like it, you know. So, um, it is the most expensive one in the lineup, yes. So, it will only pay off money-wise when you get some tax benefits and so on. And in Germany, this is the case. This will be um, a major thing also, especially if you take it as a company car with um, private taxation, private um, use percentage. Then the um, plug-in hybrids and the BEVs, the solar full battery electric vehicles they really have a big advantage there than taxation wise so this could really make sense other than that you have to see if the extra price really pays off for you fun driving wise i think it does because you just you have more fun and you're more relaxed at the same time in all the electric driving moments and yet again you can still use it for a longer term run if you're then again heading onto the motorway by the way, when I'm here in normal D mode, drive mode, I can also pull it back once more and then I'm in the B mode and then I have more recuperation when I leave off the throttle. So B for the brake mode or recuperation mode and then you can jump to the D again when you rather just want to roll. And there you can also see it in the digital instruments. So when I go off the throttle in the D mode, rather rolling, not so much recuperation, just when I'm on the brakes, then it does recuperate. Other than that, when I'm now switching to the B mode and leave off the throttle, then there's automatically re more recuperation, more reduction in speed without me hitting the brake. So I can more drive like one pedal alike, but the recuperation is not very hard. And now to our conclusion for today with the Peugeot 3008 Hybrid 4, the p half version and also in the top sporty GT trim. Well, first of all, it's a very attractive exterior and already quite unique on the market, even more so in the interior. The whole layout and also design is very unique. That's also why a lot of people go for this vehicle to have something special and especially in the GT trim, which adds those sporty elements. And also then in the p half trim where you have the gray Alcantara. This is so beautiful. Again, even more unique even than the normal 3008. And you really feel something special and you feel at home when sitting in this very interior. Of course, it's a little bit extravagant, but that's also, you know, what they thought about exactly that when building that. And I think, you know, why not being a little bit more special? It's still a very comfortable interior. You have enough space both in the rear and also in the trunk yeah there's the catch when you have tall adults you should put the front seat a little bit higher then it works better you know how the rear of this front seat is being shaped i have to know that that just functionality wise i like to be able to control the temperature a little bit easier that's maybe the only catch other than that everything works well as also for this respect the built interior quality some parts where we say, yeah, that's maybe something you should work on, then other parts which are really high class premium. Sometimes when you push yourself in the seat, you know, some, or like change the driving position, it can make some squeaks from car to car. Some, or some cars have it, some not of 3008. So those are some little things that can happen. Then driving wise was very interesting, very well insulated, nice and calm drive, suspension wise also a good compromise. And here, very funny, it's the strongest standard equipment or standard production Peugeot there is on the market because of this p -half system with this 300 horsepower system output, pretty interesting. And it is very, very strong, especially as for the acceleration, combining all the drives together. Yet again, the biggest advantage is that you have this calm electric drive, especially in city situations. And I was enjoying this electric drive so much. It is just more fun and more relaxing at the very same time. And I would like to drive it all electric um, all the time, actually. Especially then because it's maybe even more a rear wheel drive car than when you have the p -half here. Of course, combining everything front and rear drive when you drive in this hybrid mode, for example, or when you really hammer the throttle. So overall, a very enjoyable ride. 
Pricing, you can get a base Peugeot 3008 for about 25k, taking German reference price at 43k. Then when you have the GT trim with the strongest petrol engine. Yeah, and then the PHEV is about 50,000 euros. Hmm. I mean, you almost have everything in there, maybe some extras here and there, but it will stay somewhat at 50,000. So that's already quite expensive then, more towards a premium product. Yet again, if you take some benefits into account and especially thinking about the German laws at the moment now, it's not necessarily more expensive anymore than the GT trim. When you deduct something of price and again have lower tax and so on, especially using it at a company car or on the private base, then it can also make sense in a financial way. It will not be a cheapest one on the lineup if you have a better price performance, then rather pick the smaller petrol engine or something and not so much in the extras. But if you go for a high spec 3008 anyway, then it can make sense to directly go here for the plug-in hybrid version especially if you have the infrastructure already to charge it at home. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Also tune in some of the other episodes of the 3008 we have done. 5008 will also receive a hybrid version, the 508 as well. It depends on if they also get the rear wheel drive version that has to be seen later on. The 3008 will be available in both trims. So the PHEV front wheel drive electric motor, but also the dual electric motor as we had here today. So. About this car leave us your feedback and also tune in next time